today I've got another interview style problem. I know a lot of you have got your Oxford maths interviews this week. I believe most of the Cambridge ones are done by now, but maybe there's a few left. And I thought I'd show you another interview style problem and again, show you how I would explain this if I was the one in the interview seat. So let's have a look. We've got x squared plus y squared equals 3z squared and x, y and z are integers. We want to solve this equation, find all the solutions to this equation. Before I dive into a solution, if you've not seen me before, my name's Jamin, I studied maths at the University of Oxford, and so I've done the interview before, done the whole process before, studied there, and now I help students try and do the same. Now I'm going to answer this as if I was an interviewee. Okay, so when I'm looking at this equation, there's a few things that spring to mind initially. Firstly, there's some symmetry here in x and y. And so why is that useful? Well, that tells us that if x, y, z is a solution to this equation, then also y, x, z will be a solution as well. So our solutions will kind of come in pairs with the exception of when x and y are the same number. Okay. I also notice there's one pretty obvious solution as well here, 0, 0, 0, because 0 is an integer. We're not necessarily looking at like positive integers or anything. So I'll make a note of that. There may be other solutions. Another thing I've noticed is we've got obviously lots of squares here, which is very nice. Every kind of x, y, or z, each of the letters has been squared. And so that means it doesn't really matter if x or y is positive or negative, because when you square it, you're going to get the same answer. 3 squared is the same as negative 3 squared. So if x, y, z is a solution, not only will I know that y, x, z is a solution, but I'll also know that plus or minus x, plus or minus y, plus or minus z will also be a solution. Which tells me that, well, without loss of generality, to begin with, I can just focus on the non-negative solutions. And then any other, any other solution that would involve negative x, y's, or z's would have a corresponding solution in this kind of set here. So it suffices to just look at the, the case where x, y, and z are non-negative. Okay. Another thing I'm noticing here is it actually reminds me of the derivation of the fact that there are infinitely many Pythagorean, uh, sorry, primitive Pythagorean triples. So the idea there is that obviously in Pythagoras' theorem you have x squared plus y squared equals just z squared, and that there are infinitely many solutions to that there. The reason being, or the, one of the ways you prove it is by um, or what, the reason why primitive Pythagorean triples sorry, are inter more interesting than regular Pythagorean triples is because, for example, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. That's a solution to Pythagoras' theorem. But, of course, I could scale these numbers up, so 3 times lambda squared plus 4 times lambda squared, and that would, you know, because I could factor out a lambda squared, it would just be 5 lambda squared. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that in Pythagoras' theorem, the thing that motivates looking at primitive Pythagorean triples is the fact that there's obviously going to be infinitely many Pythagorean triples because you could just take this guy and scale it up. Now, we can ask ourselves, could we do something similar here? And the answer is yes. So x, y, and z, if they did have some common factor, let's say lambda, I could divide this whole equation by lambda squared and get another similar equation. So let me just clarify that there. Right, let, me, let me keep that there. So if x, let's say, was uh, lambda times, let's call it a, y was lambda times b, and z was lambda times c, then x squared plus y squared equals 3z squared. That would just become uh, lambda squared times a squared plus b squared equals lambda squared times 3z uh, c squared. And cancelling those guys, um, again, assuming lambda here is positive, we get another solution to this. So we may as well assume that we have x, y, and z not sharing a common factor. And what I suspect is the case that we won't have any solutions to this, and maybe we can use some sort of infinite descent type argument. Anyway, what another thing I've thought about here is perhaps using modular arithmetic. We've got square numbers. I know squares can only take a certain set of values like mod 4 and mod 8. But I also know that they can only take a certain set of values mod 3. And the reason I'm drawn towards mod 3 is, well, we've got this lovely little 3 on the right-hand side here. So if I look at both sides of the equation mod 3, ah, I think that's it. So I know that square numbers, so x, uh, let me not use x. If, let's say, a is an integer, I know that a squared must either be 0 or 1 mod 3. 
The reason being because if a is an integer, then a can be written as 3 times some number plus r, where r is 0, 1, or 2. So in other words, a being an integer, if I divide it by 3, uh, I'm going to get a remainder of either 0, 1, or 2. That's what this equation here is representing. So m here is just some integer. Then, obviously, if I square that, I get 9m squared plus 6mr plus r squared. But if I look at that mod 3, that's just r squared because those two terms are 0 mod 3. And if I just consider the possible values that this could be, that 0 squared, 1 squared, or 2 squared, which is the same as 0, 1, but 2 squared is 4, which is the same as 1. So a squared has to be either 0 or 1 mod 3. And then that tells me that this left-hand side here, uh, each of these terms is either going to be, let me change my color here, either 0 or 1 mod 3, and same for this guy, 0 or 1. And obviously this right-hand side, that's going to be 0 mod 3. Now this is interesting because, obviously for this left-hand side here, well the right-hand side definitely equals 0. So the left-hand side has to equal 0. And if I try and do 1 plus 1, that's 2 mod 3. 1 plus 0 or 0 plus 1, that's only 1 mod 3. So the only way I can get 0 on the left-hand side is if I have x and y both being 0 mod 3, which is fine, except for the fact that that means that x and y must be multiples of 3. And so if I just re write this down here. So by considering both sides mod 3, we get that x equals, let's say, 3 times p and y equals 3 times q. And if I substitute that into this equation he here, I get 3, or sorry, 9p squared plus 9y squared equals 3 times z squared. Fine. If I divide through by 3 here, I get 3p squared plus 3y squared equals z squared. And now z here has to be a multiple of 3 because the left-hand side is a multiple of 3, so z squared is a multiple of 3, which means z is a multiple of 3. So I can say z is 3r, let's say. And then you can kind of see where this is going. This is going to give us p squared plus y squared equals 3r squared. And we get a very similar equation to what we started with. So my suspicion was correct. We can use infinite descent here to prove that there are no solutions beyond the trivial solution. Essentially, what we've done here is shown that if there is a solution where x, y, and z are positive, then there'd be one that's smaller than it by essentially dividing each of x, y, and z by 3. Or essentially, another way to think about it is we've proved that x, y, and z it ha would have to have a common multiple of 3. But the issue is, if I have a solution, let's say 12 squared plus, let's just make up some numbers here, plus 6 squared, equals 21 squared, uh, 3 times 21 squared. Obviously, that's not the case. But the idea is I could just divide this by... Th these numbers here would all have to be multiples of 3. So I could divide it by this equation by 3 squared. But then again, the same argument tells me that those numbers there would have to be multiples of 3. And of course, 4 isn't a multiple of 3. The idea is obviously if I could repeatedly divide a positive number by 3, eventually it won't be an integer. And so that proves that this equation actually has no solutions beyond the trivial solution. And that solves this. Cool. And so that's how I would answer this if I was in an Oxford interview. A couple of points where in the middle I was maybe stumbling a little bit. But I think overall the, the crucial parts of the explanation were there. I kind of laid out my observations at the start, made some very, very useful observations as well the symmetry, noticing that I can assume without loss of generality that x, y, and z are at least zero, and this idea of infinite descent, and also then finishing it off nicely with modular arithmetic. You can see that there's lots and lots of different kind of ingredients to this solution here. Anyway, if you have got your interviews this week, I wish you the best of luck, and if you're preparing for next year, good, you've started uh, on time, which is good to see. Anyway, Thanks so much, and I'll leave another video on screen where I solve another interview-style problem so you can have a little bit more prep for your interviews. I'll catch you over there.